The 15 mark comprehension at the back of paper two for AQA A-level biology is notoriously one of the hardest questions on the entire A-level. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking you through my exact strategy of how I approach the comprehension questions so that you can do exactly the same thing in paper two and try and get as many of those 15 marks as possible. Hey everyone, and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. And in this video, I'm going through everything comprehensions, my top tips and how to get as many marks as possible on this. Now, now, if you do want even more advice on the comprehension, because let's face it, it's 15 marks of that paper, which is a big chunk, then let me tell you about the one hour lesson that you can actually watch, which is the recording of the Easter boot camp that I did. In that one hour, I go through exactly how to answer the application question with a modeled example, and you get a workbook with modeled examples, the mark scheme, examiner's feedback to help explain the mistakes students made and how you can avoid those mistakes. And if you do want that, then I'll link it in the description below so you can get your hands on that full hour comprehension lesson. But for now, let's get into the key facts about the comprehension. Number one, it is 15 marks. So there'll be a selection of questions linked to the comprehension. Collectively, they add up to 15 marks. It's on paper two and it is right at the back of paper two. After the text, it always then says, use the information on the passage and your knowledge to answer the following questions. So essentially they are all application questions because you're having to use the text and your knowledge to be able to answer the questions. It's usually 15 to 20 lines worth of text and they number every five lines in the paragraphs so that they can then direct you to which lines to look at specifically when you're answering each individual question. And then lastly, the questions tend to be application, but also I have seen maths questions come up linked to the comprehension as well. So those are the key facts. Next then, let me go through my key strategies for answering the comprehension questions before I do a modeled example for you. So the first thing I recommend is read through the entire block of information, but as you read through, highlight as you go. And the sorts of things I'd be highlighting are what you think might be a key term or key hint at a topic that it might be linking to. So highlight the information as you're reading through it. And then link to that, my second tip is annotate as you go. So some of the highlights, I might not have an annotation because it might be fairly obvious. I've highlighted enzyme just to point out to myself that this topic is going to be about enzymes where it might be linking to transcriptional factor enzymes, for example. But annotations are when you might have a bit of information where I stop and pause and think, what is the relevance of that sentence? And I'll try and work out which topic it might link to, or if it's to do with an experiment, I might work out, is that the independent variable? Is that the dependent variable? Is it a control variable? Is it a controlled experiment? So I start to consider the information I've been given and try and work out what is the relevance of them giving me this fact or what bit of information does that link to? Now that'll make more sense when I do the worked example with you very shortly. Tip number three is do not start on the comprehension. It is at the back of paper two. It's worth 15 marks. It should take about 20 minutes, but I do not suggest you start on it, which that might sound obvious because it's at the back. But the reason I say that is my tip for paper one, which has already happened now, is start at the back on the long answer questions. But I do not recommend that for the comprehension because it is one of the hardest questions on the paper and it's mainly application. So you are better off saving it to the end when your brain is already awake and active and warmed up. And also it means that you aren't going to maybe panic and spend loads of time on it and run out of time on the rest of the questions. So save it to the end. Ideally you should have 20 minutes left when you get onto the comprehension. And then my final tip is apply all the same strategies I've talked to you about in my application videos, because these are basically all application questions. So if you haven't seen my application skills video, then I'll link it up here. Definitely watch that so you know the four key tips of what I recommend for how to approach all application questions to get full marks. So those are the key facts. Those are the key strategies. Let's now go over to me answering some of these questions to model it for you so you can see how best to apply it and improve. So let's go through this example then. And as I said, I'm going to be going through it with the workbook that comes with the one hour lesson. I won't go through the whole thing because obviously that was a one hour lesson. So I'm going to skip past some of what we already talked about and get to the 
practice question. Um, and as I said, I won't go through all of it. I just want to be able to model to you the tips that I said and the strategies how you could apply that. So I'm just getting my highlighter ready so I can start by highlighting the key information because that's what I said would be essential for this. So we've got the placenta is a specialized exchange surface. So specialized exchange surface. I'd be highlighting that because whenever I hear exchange surface, and this could be something you'd then annotate, I'd be considering that if it's exchanging, it could be gas exchange, starting about large surface area, short diffusion pathways, maintaining the concentration gradients. So those would be some of the concepts that I might just annotate at that point where I've highlighted. Then we've got in the placenta, substances are exchanged between the blood of a fetus and blood of its mother. And then we are specifically told gas exchange for the fetus occurs in the placenta. So I'm just going to add in, so I don't lose track now, some of the key things that we had said. So we've got here blood of a fetus, blood of its mother. I'd probably annotate at this point, just making reference to fetal hemoglobin versus adult hemoglobin, because there might be some question linked to that, considering thinking about the differences in affinity. So then we've got the there's also transfer of IgG antibodies in placenta between the mother's blood and the fetal blood. And these IgG antibodies protect the fetus against the pathogen that infects its mother during pregnancy. So the fact that we're getting antibodies being passed through, not necessarily, um, in fact, it doesn't say you get the memory B cells or the plasma cells. I'd then probably add that this is an example of passive immunity. And the IgG antibodies can circulate at high concentration in the mother's blood for months or years. A fetus does not produce those antibodies. So yeah, I'd definitely be highlighting or annotating on. It's passive immunity because they've even emphasized there that you're not getting the antibodies being created. They're just gaining the ones that are already made by the mother. The UK Immunisation Programme vaccinates as many babies as possible to protect the UK population um, against pathogens such as measles, virus and tetanus bacteria. So what I'd be thinking here is primary and secondary immune response so thinking about those graphs where you see you get far more antibodies being created and much uh, more rapidly as well. And the fact that they're saying it protects the whole UK population, I'd be considering herd immunity as well. So then we've got measles viruses spread quickly from infected people despite the efforts of the NHS. So yeah, measles virus can spread quickly. So this is definitely linking to the concept of herd immunity. Despite the eff efforts of the NHS, there's been a recent increase in the number of children catching measles. So what I'd be considering then is, well, why is that the case? If they are trying to vaccinate babies, but despite their efforts, more children are getting measles. I mean, well, why might that be the case? Either it must be that people aren't getting their children vaccinated so maybe there's a fear of vaccines or it could be they haven't actually said that people aren't getting vaccinated so maybe it's to do with antigen variability and maybe the measles virus and um, there's been mutations in the DNA and therefore the vaccine's no longer effective so that's the sort of thing I'd be annotating on. Tetanus bacteria enter the body through skin wounds. Tetanus bacteria do not spread from infected people okay so what that would then tell me is if you can't if it doesn't get spread from person to person that means the vaccine itself Itself will protect an individual who has the vaccine, but it doesn't provide any herd immunity because this isn't a bacteria that is spread from person to person. You only get if it enters through a skin wound and you touch a surface of the bacteria on it. So that's what I'd be annotating for this bit. In order to develop good immunity against tetanus, children are given three tetanus vaccinations at regular intervals before their first birthday. So what I'd be considering there is um, normally you have those primary and secondary immune response graphs with just the two peaks to show the first time that you are infected and then the second time um, where you would assume that is the actual antigen or pathogen getting in. If they're having three vaccines, that means this is mimicking a primary, secondary and tertiary immune response. So they actually get three peaks on that graph. And when they then potentially get infected with the pathogen, that would represent a fourth peak. So the concept here must be that for this vaccine to be effective, you have to be able to produce a very large number of antibodies very rapidly. And that's why you need to do three vaccines to get three peaks so you've already had your primary secondary and tertiary immune response 
And when you're actually infected, that'd be a quaternary immune response. So that's how I would approach processing and understanding this information, highlighting and writing in all of those key points that I've said. And then you can go on to answering the actual questions. So let's just go, oh, I don't know if it's going to let me with this highlighter. So we might suddenly lose these highlights. Let's just see. Yeah, fortunately we lost them. But anyway, let's scroll down. I showed you that bit. So the question then is, gas exchange for the fetus occurs in the placenta. And they tell you, look at line, three. One, two, three, just here. Describe how the composition of blood in the pulmonary artery of a fetus is different from the composition of the blood in the pulmonary artery of its mother and give one reason for the difference. So it is focusing on gas exchange. So we have to consider gases in this answer. And they've said describe how the composition of the blood is different. So that means what is in it, not pressure of it, for example. And if we're talking about gas exchange and composition, I'm, I would think we're going to need to be talking about the concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide in those two different blood vessels. So you can pause and have a go. I want to go through to some student answers, feedback and what it should have been and why. So the mark scheme was the fetal blood has more oxygen or you could have said the fetal blood has less carbon dioxide and they accepted the converse for those. The explanation, you have to give one reason for the difference, so give the difference and then give a reason, is because gas exchange occurs in the placenta for the fetus so that means that when the blood is passing through, it's already got a high concentration compared to the mother's pulmonary artery, which is carrying the blood, the deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get oxygenated because that is where gas exchange happens for the mother. Um, so that would be the explanation. Now, common mistakes linked to this then for students were the difference in blood composition was often given as a physical difference rather than actually saying the composition, which is like chemical composition. So many people talked about the pressure the thickness, the volume, consistency. So that was why that was an error. Another mistake was um, the reason for the difference was often correct, correctly related to gas exchange or diffusion, but without reference to location. So you had to say the location to differentiate between the fetus and the mother. So not just saying there would be more oxygen, you'd have to say more oxygen in the fetus's pulmonary artery compared to the mother's. And then the last one we've got is the reason was often related to less blood in the fetus or less respiration in the fetus. It was not unusual to find gas exchange not occurring in the lungs expressed as fetus not breathing. So that's just a, an error there, like a misconception. And the reason for that is the fetus receives blood from the mother, so it would be the same volume, but also the fetus will be respiring, all living things are respiring, and knowing that the gas exchange is occurring in the placenta. So gas exchange is occurring even though it's not happening in the lungs, it's happening in the placenta. So that's just one example. The main thing I wanted you to show, wanted to show you was how I would go through that information and then one example of the type of question and how it links to it. Now, as I said, if you were interested, I'm not going to go through all of this because we've gone through quite a bit on the comprehension, but if you were interested, then this booklet is included in that one hour comprehension lesson. As you can see, lots of questions with the model answers that you can go through for that one if you were interested. So that is it, my key tips and strategies of how to answer the comprehension questions and some modeled examples. And as I said, if you do want even more practice and help on this, then check out the link in the description where there is the one hour comprehension lesson with the workbook, which you just saw me using some of it there in that recording. But for now, best of luck for paper two. I will be doing a last minute tips video for paper two in a couple of days, so don't miss out on that. But for now, best of luck with your revision and I'll see you in a couple of days.